Okay. Okay. Welcome back to multi-user, multi-antenna communications course. Let's start again with uh, the look at the schedule. So we have uh, three lectures left. Uh, unfortunately, the industry lecture that I was talking about is cancelled. The guys seem to be too busy with work. So maybe next time, two years. So three lectures left. We will be focusing on the last slide set, L6, uh, which I'm still preparing, so it's not yet, yet there. It's about two thirds ready, hopefully tonight. Or at latest, uh, during the weekend, I will complete it. So first, there's an exercise now scheduled for next uh, Wednesday. So we should put out the uh, description today, tomorrow, the latest. And one one problem is fixed. It's the, uh, the robust team for the design. We'll think about that. The other one. Then we will also make the, uh, the final project available at latest early next week. And I, I have a pretty good idea what it will be. We will be discussing about that topic today. It's going to be decentralized minimum power beamforming implementation. And then second midterm uh, next week, Thursday. Now there is a possibility if everyone agrees uh, to postpone it by a little bit to the next week. That's a holiday week. I wouldn't be here, but uh, if you prefer, if no, no one uh, say, uh, is against that idea, we can postpone it to the next week. Okay. I will put uh, a vote to model. So if there's anyone objecting, we will keep that the current date. And they will be final later. So no problem. But that's that's an option, okay, to give you more time to, to study the second part of this course. Any objections right away? Not, not from this part. Okay. I will put a an announcement in Moodle just to. Or is there anyone who would prefer? Oh, okay, you don't have to respond to this right now. Uh, I will put a vote in Moodle. Do we have a lecture on Thursday? Say again? Do we have a lecture Thursday? Uh, not for the moment. Next Thursday, we have to oh, Okay, next Thursday, we could, okay, if we postpone the uh, exam, then we could have extra lecture we will see I, I will put out the uh, and actually there's an ex possible extra lecture for this week Thursday but uh, for the moment uh, not there okay let's start with the uh, multi-point MIMOX communication so uh, as I said, I'm still preparing it, but this is more or less the content I'm done up to this point. So we will start with the general overview about multi-cell communication, discuss about different uh, communication strategies, coherent joint transmission, coordinated beamforming, anything in between. Then we'll introduce the multi-cell system model including now multi-antenna receivers. So this is the, the most complicated model that we'll be dealing with. Then we will revisit the capacity optimal strategy, just one slide, uh, without going into details, just present the, the solution directly. It's just that it's a modif modified version of the uh, broadcast capacity with some power constraint. Now we can, since we have a multi, point transmission, multiple base stations with multiple power constraints. So we impose those multiple power constraints now in the downlink. But when we, when we solve the, the capacity, the sun rate or uh, rate region, we have to again go to the dual uplink. 
and how to take into account those per basis and per antenna foot or per antenna power consequence. It's a bit tricky. It makes a min max problem. But I will, I will give you some simple ex examples uh, to demonstrate how it works. Then we'll very briefly discuss about degrees of freedom via interference alignment, just to give a, a flavor. What happens if we don't have the coherent joint transmission, which is the optimal thing to do? So if we have a strategy where we serve each user by a single transmitter, uh, we will look at in the high SMR regime, how many parallel streams we can schedule all together in that fully connected interference network uh, without causing interference between uh, streams. Then we will move on to linear coordinated transceiver design. It's an extension of the, the uh, slide set five, where we consider just a single antenna receivers. Now we will consider multi antenna receivers and multiple transmitters, each, each with the uh, individual uh, power constraints, uh, per basis and power constraints. And, and then uh, we will look at some numerical examples that I did more than 10 years ago, comparing coherent, coherent transmission versus coordinate beamforming in different scenarios. What are the uh, the, the gains with respect to gain, gain versus pay, basically. And then we will move on to this decentralized minimum power beam forming with limited backfall. It's just an extension of the minimum power beam forming that we covered quite extensively in slide set five for a single transmitter, multiple receivers. Now we have multiple transmitters, multiple receivers, but now with single single receivers. This is a special case of, the, of this general multi-cell system model. We'll start with the centralized implementation, which is basically the same as in the uh, uh, single cell can be solved optimally. We yeah. associate the up and down in duality whatsoever. But now if you want to implement it in decentralized manner, meaning that each beam former is designed only based on a locally available information that leads to interesting uh, 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 decomposition. We have to decompose the, the global beamformer design across this distributed uh, antenna elements or base stations. And uh, what is required for the, the backhaul information exchange to carry out that processing. This, this is something we will describe in, uh, this, discuss in detail. And this will be your project also to implement basically using dual decomposition or primal decomposition, or maybe even ADMM. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, we will discuss weighted sun rate maximization in this multi-cell environment. Uh, describe how, how that leads to kind of alternating optimization, transmitter, receiver, uh, how it can be decentralized, we will focus mostly on the, the coordinated beam forming scenario. And uh, then we will discuss, if time permits, we will discuss some practical signaling schemes, how this uh, beam forming training can be, can be implemented in practice using pilots, bidirectional training, exchanging pilots between transmitters and receivers. Let's see how how much time we will spend. Okay, <clears throat> something general, interference limited networks. So conventionally, um, if you think about 3G, 4G, and the first way to 5G, cellular uh, systems, you have base stations distributed the coverage area, and then you have that based on some network planning to provide as uh, uniform coverage as possible to customers. So traditionally, each user is served by the closest base station or the best base station at a given time. 
right? <clears throat> and then when the user moves, moves around at some point, there's a so-called handover. That is, if this user moves to the coverage area of this cell, it's handed over with some control information uh, happening in the in the backbone network and it over to that one. But still every user is served by a single transmit point, right? <clears throat> so if there's some data stream coming, the user is here, the data type goes to this base station and that base station carries out the baseband process so that this data stream reaches this user here, but then the user moves here, this pipe is just removed entirely to the other base. Now, when we are serving multiple users at the same time, <clears throat> we have interference, right? This user, when we are serving this user, we are causing interference to that user, to that user, right? So every transmission from the base station causes, um, from every base station causes interference to every user, right? Because we are broadcasting, right? It's a broadcast channel. By being forming, we can steer, we can shape the transmission pattern in a way that also that interference is controlled. That's something that we will discuss much more in detail. If you don't have any coordination, if you don't have any coordination between base stations, <clears throat> we are only focusing on serving our own users, right? Then the interference. Um, the only way to treat the interference at the other cell user is in your receiver process, right? If the, if the users have multiple antennas, they could try to move the interference coming from that, the interference basis and so forth. <clears throat> now, allowing this co coordination between um, base station, between these distributed uh, transmission points we can substantially reduce this inter-user industry interference with the users. And, and optimal, optimally used jointly designed the transmit beam formers and receive beam formers at each user in the network to fully minimize the, or basically to maximize a certain utility, which leads to a, a finding a good balance between uh, the desired signal and suppressing the interference. Remember that suppressing the interference, you should never suppress the interference to zero, but more or less the same level as most, like the MMSC type standards. <clears throat> okay, so this is the, uh, the, the classical way. Of course, if, that, if you think about 2G, 3G, 4G networks, the interference is handled in some way, right? You can, you can handle it. The, the most rudimental way is to the, the reuse of resources, right? So you use this different frequencies, right? like in GSM, that you have a certain frequency we use, a certain base station uses one frequency. So the, <clears throat> that same frequency is allocated to another base station, which is sufficiently far away, right? But that's very inefficient. The current current networks they are all like 4G and 5G, they are all operating the same frequencies, and we are more relying on that multi-antenna processing. All right. So now we, if we allow coordination among cells, um, it obviously provides increased spatial decrease of freedom. So if we have a system with uh, n sub b, which is a um, uh, number of base stations, each with n sub t transmit antennas, we can ideally accommodate the same number of streams. It's the same as if we have, let's say, three base stations that are far away from each other, each serving the four users, which are close to basis, right? So in this case, whatever the transmit here, it's 
attenuated so much here that it can be below the noise level, so it can be this part, right? So here, of course, we can do all the design independently, right? And we can accommodate both degrees of freedom in this case, right? The same can be achieved even if we if we bring all these 12 users to this cell center, but then we allow this coordination that we have a central central entity that collects all that information and carries out the beam the design point. You can consider this then as that virtual mind with 12 contents, right? Being able to serve 12 users without interference. So this is that the absolute upper bound, what we can do, coherent multi-cell network MIMO or virtual MIMO, considering all this distributed of these spaces and as antennas of a uh, distributed MIMO uh, network. Okay, this is about the coherent multi-cell transmission. <clears throat> so in this case, Each user, here we have four users, um, are served jointly by these two base stations, right? So if we have a it's four users here, we are generating, uh, this is base station one, base station two, we are generating here a transmit, transmission vector x1. X11, X12, X13, X14. And here we have a transmission vector X2. Similarly, each entry of the vector corresponding to each antenna. So the transmission vector is a superposition of uh, precoder, precoder uh, vectors, uh, the M2, K, D, K, right? So we are basically trans we are serving all four users with a base station specific uh, precoder. Similarly here, M1, K, D, K. Okay. So we are sending the same data stream I get data stream E1, E2, D3, and E4. So we're sending the same stream from this two phase data, right? This is the joint transmission. Okay. <clears throat> but the, the, the problem here, and this is the best thing to do. The practical problem is that we need to have a centralized entity, ideally. You can do this also in a distributed manner, but using some iterative methods and some extra signal, we have done some recent work on that as well. But ideally, you need to gather all these measurements. So if you if you think about TPD system, these users send pilots in uplink like this, Base station measures this pilot at each antenna, so it can recover the channel H1, H11, H12, H13, and so forth. And similarly, here from the uplink pilots, this base station two can estimate the channel H21, H22, and so forth. Okay, and all these channels are then collected at the centralized entity, which has now global, global uh, knowledge about uh, how this potential uh, transmission from these multiple transmit points would cause interference to uh, among users, right? So you can simply reconstruct a virtual MIMO channel so this one here would be, if we gather all these channels together, let's say the base station one, 
we could call this H1, the bar, this would be H11, H12, H13, H14. Okay, this would be a four by four matrix here. Similarly, H2 would be H21, H22, H23, H24. Okay, this would be also a four by four matrix. Now we can just construct a, uh, a virtual minor. And we could basically assume that this is a single transit that means a transmit antennas. So we would then stack this channel as uh, page one, page two, right? Would be eight, eight by four channel, right? Or Eight by four, so eight transmit antennas, four users. So eight per mission is of course four by eight. And then we can also think about the precoders. Precoder matrix would be then we could stack all these precoder matrix, precoder vectors in the one matrix, and then stack, and we would have a precoder matrix, which is also eight by two. Okay. M1, M2, where M1 is simply M11, M12, and so forth, right? Just that. Like so now we have a kind of equivalent single cell setup. And let's just plug and play whatever we did in uh, uh, slide set five. We can have plug it. Idea. The only thing that complicates this centralized thing is we don't have a power constraint. But that's easy to handle in a centralized case. Instead of having a sum power constraint, let's say MK smaller than P, now you would have a per antenna, a per base station power constraint, mk, uh, sum over m, sum over k, and then mdk square smaller than t sub b for all b. And that's the only difference. Okay? So you just constrain the base station specific beam power vectors. The sum power to be less than certain constant. Okay. So, how this can be implemented in practice? There are many ways. Uh, one, uh, maybe costly, uh, to be honest, I, have, I haven't been really following the latest trends in the possible implementations. <laughs> but you, you could think that you have a radio over fiber that's a very simple. Uh, uh, distributed antennas, basically just uh, uh, just RF parts, and then you are just converting the RF to uh, uh, stuff that you can um, you know, using radio with fiber, optical you know, direct conversion from radio to optical, and then using these optical cables to collect all that all this radio signals in the optical form to a centralized entity this then carries out all the process right the down conversion ad da baseband processing everything happening in that that's that let's say that the most centralized way to implement but then you can have a uh, different functional splits that okay you can assign now more roles to the base station or the distributed antennas you can have ADDA there, some basic OFDM processing whatsoever, and then uh, pass these uh, quantized basement signals to the 
to the central entity and so forth. So there are pros and cons. Um, how to implement this? Uh, to be honest, uh, the practical implementation of this coherent uh, point transmission um, It's, it's possible in principle, but it has not yet been realized in, uh, in 4G networks, for example. There was a lot of discussion for LP advance. In principle, it is allowed in the standard, but as far as I know, the downlink transmission specifically, the uplink is easy, but the downlink uh, coherent transmission is difficult in LTE. Uh, that's why it's not uh, widely implemented. In 5G, in principle, it's much more likely to happen because the, the radio interface supports it much better. It's mostly based on TDD by default, short range communication, uh, much shorter frame lengths and so forth. So the, the channel, um, uh, channel knowledge can be assumed to be much more accurate in 5G than in 4G. That's why it can be we can assume the reciprocity and use these uplink measurements with TDD systems to design um, the downlink transcript precoders much more efficiently, including also the joint transmission. Okay, coordinated multi cell transmission. So, this is a scenario where now again we constrain the transmission per user to happen from a single transmit point only, right? So this, for example, in this case that we have four users in the cell edge, right? We have a selection problem that which space station we should serve, or which space station we should choose to serve a given user, right? If the path loss is the same, right? In principle, even if we use the path loss as a criterion, then in principle, you know, all these users could be allocated to in principle, all these users could be served by this space station or that space station or any combination of those. Of course, the main difference here is that this is still not interference limited because in both space stations we have enough degrees of freedom to serve all these four users. In the coherent transmission, in principle, we could double the number of users to eight because we have eight degrees of freedom. Okay, so the highest NR this can provide 100% throughput gain. Okay, um, one, uh, so there are, there are several practical um, simplifications that follow from using coordinate beamforming with respect to coherence. We don't need to have necessarily global CSI. We can, we can have very efficient uh, before my design, just based on local measurements, right? So the this base station can measure its own users, these two users are now allocated to this base station, but it can also measure the cross channel, right? So in principle, if you design these B, B formers in a way that there's no interference going to these two users using zero pulses, right? This has four antennas, so it can serving these two users that still uh, two degrees of freedom for nulling the interference. So the interference can be completely avoided. That's that's one option, but it's uh, highly suboptimal. <coughs> it's the lowest amount of reason. This is something we will also go later on. So local CSI is enough. If we allow some information exchange, but uh, Greatly reduced with respect to the coherence, we can we can make make um, the performance better. Basically, you should by exchanging some information, um, both base stations could know what is the optimal level of interference that I can cause to the other cell users while serving my own users. Right? This follows from this uh, decomposition structure that that we will discuss much more. Indeed, another uh, simplification is that we don't need 
you have carrier based coherence. So the local oscillators do not need to be as tightly synchronized as in the coherent case. In the coherent case, if, if there's some drift, so we have a local <coughs> oscillators here uh, at both base stations. Now, when we are measuring in uplink, the, the channels, if there's any drift in the local oscillators, right, between the measurement time and the transmission time, then uh, the, uh, this drift will cause interference. It is an interference. We will look at the math, the math a little bit later on where it comes from. But uh, there is a quite stringent requirement for, for this carrier based coherence for the coherent transfers. Right. Okay, so this is in general much simpler to implement, but the problem is that, or that the loss is the decrease of freedom. Right? Here you are limited by the principle, limited by the, the number of decrease of freedom available. At one one base station. Of course, <coughs> when you take the base stations apart and you take some of these users closer to the base station, then also the interference uh, reduces, right? And at some point, when you take the base stations hard enough, hard enough, you can ignore the interference, and then you're back to a degrees of freedom. Okay, multi cell system model. This is again just an extension of the single cell case. Might appear a bit complicated in the beginning, but it's, it's simple in there. Let's just focus on a single user first. Okay, so we have a user K here. And our set of base stations, which is Matcal uh, B here, it's one, one, two, three. Okay. Now the received signal at user K is simply you're transmitting something from here, the x1, or it's x1 prime, x2 prime, and x3 prime. These are vectors. This is just a transmitted single vector across antennas. So, vector of length four. So, what we get here is simply a superposition of all these transmissions. This is x1. K, H2, K, H3, K, right? The sum some uh, over these three base stations, B, one, two, three, H, B, K, H, B prime, okay? And then we add some noise at the receiver. Right? Okay, this is the single user case. Multi antenna transmit the multi antenna receiver. Okay, now if we add another user here, okay, that the figure gets a bit more complicated. Let's add the user here. Okay, now we have we have let's say the one and then the two. So we have H one two, H three two, and H uh, two two. Okay. So now the is signal. The transmitting signal is now. We can now split the 
transmission sync, transmitted signal to user specific. We are transmitting now a superposition of user specific transmitted signal vector. So it's, a, it's simply a superposition XBK over K that belong to the user set served by the base station B, right? UP. This is, does include some indices. This does a general. Now, now actually, we assume that both users are served by all base states, right? But now we have to have a more complicated scenario that, okay, this user is served only by these two base stations, and uh, this user is served by these two base stations, right? So for user one, uh, the serving serving set, the solid serving set would be um, for user one, it would be one and three. And for user two, it would be two and three. Okay. So this is the general model. Of course, now we have still the interference, right? Because we are transmitting, transmitting to, to this guy, we are causing interference to that guy. But that's not the desire, right? This is interference now, because because we are not we are not sending a desired signal to this guy, only to that guy from this vector. So this is just the general general way to use this indexing. Okay, this is this applies all, right? But then we can start splitting the transmission into different parts. So here we have the desired parts for a certain user K. So it collects all transmitted signals from, from the base stations that are serving that user K, right? The B sub K is the base in collect, um, contains the base station indices that are serving user K. So this is the desired signal of user K. This is the, uh, let's say, inter-user interference uh, from the same set of base stations that are serving user K, excluding user K. Right? Same set of indices here, the same channels, but just containing the um, transmitted signals for users uh, in the same user set with user K, but uh, with different indices that's user K. And here we have some kind of a intercell or interactive set interference includes all the base stations that are not in the serving set, right? And that collects all the all the remaining indices. Okay, it's just you know splitting splitting this x prime into smaller parts. This x prime it's just a superposition of user specific components, right? What's the ABK? Okay, sorry about that. So ABK is that the path loss. Yes. So here we have split V. The channel, this is the channel matrix from base station B to user K. This is the normalized kind of fast fading part of the channel matrix. And this is the, the path gain due to the propagation loss. Okay. It can be included in H, but it would just change the variance of each term of H to the ABK square. Okay, now we can split the transmit signal into, if we focus on, if we focus on, for example, here we have a summation over all K. 
pay that belong to that. U1, and we can actually notice that there's only one user. Only user one belongs to the user set of base station one, right? Base station one is not serving base station two, it's only for the interface, right? So X prime here would be simply M11 B1. This is the beamformer. Capital N. Okay, we could still transmit multiple streams. This is now the matrix because we can, in principle, we can transmit up to two streams to this user because it has two antennas. So the degrees of freedom for this, the, the rank of the, the channel matrix between the base station one and user one is at most two, right? Because it's a four by two. Final channel. Okay. In general, now if we are looking about looking the transmitted signal from base station three, this is now uh, sum of because base station three is serving now user two and three, so we have m. B two D serving. Uh, okay, sorry, we had two users. So it's serving both users, one and two. Three one B one plus M three two B two. Okay, this would be the transmitted signal from base So at most, again, we are now, notice that we are sending the same stream E1 from both base station one and three. We're going to go ahead and transmit it from base station one and three to user one. And similarly for Base SM2. <clears throat> Base SM2 would be only serving user two and not user one. Okay. So we can split the uh, transmitted signal vector from base SM2 to user K to the uh, recording matrix N sub B K times. Uh, the vector of data symbols <coughs> allocated to that given user. And the, the vector, the length of the vector is given by the rank, the upper bound of the, uh, the equivalent channel matrix. N sub k is now the, the number of, uh, this is the size of the active set, how many base systems are serving. That given user k, let's say for user one, n sub k is two, because it's served by two base settings. So it is basically uh, the virtual transmitter can be considered to have eight antennas. But then the, the, user, the user itself has uh, two antennas. The number of streams that we can allocate to user k is, in this case, limited by two. So at most we can get allocate two streams to that uh, given user in that particular example. In general, it applies to any uh, parameter parameter visualization. Okay. So in general, uh, when we formulate later on this uh, optimization criteria uh, optim uh, and formulate as a joint optimization of the transmit pre transmit precoder and the receive. Uh, pre-coder or receive decoder or receive beam forward. Uh, <clears throat> when, when you minimize or maximize that uh, utility with respect to the receive beam former, the optimal receiver is always MMSC or scaled MMSC receiver. It's always for linear transmitter design, for linear only, of course. <clears throat> so 
If you now write if you now write the uh, the MMSC between uh, D K the transitive data simple vector and D hat K where the estimate D hat K is given at the output of the received beam former and use a K so we can replace that with W K Y okay when we expand when we when you plug in Y Question. Yes. Yes. Um, when you plug in the, the received signal vector here, expand it, take the expectation of the cross cross term vanish, the same as we have done for the, uh, the uplink case, no difference, and then differentiate with respect to WK. When you take the arc mean WK of this one, it results in WK and MSC, which is given in 6.2. It's just plotting, it's exactly the same as done in, in slide set 3, 4 for uplink K. <clears throat> No difference whatsoever. And you can see that all these terms that appear here also appear in the in this uh, formula, right? You just plug in that yk in there and uh, do the calculus and you get the MMSC received. Okay, now complicated looking formula. So how if we have now uh, a joint transmission set up, we have this ends up the base station serving some capital K users. Yes. How can we compute the maximum? What is the uh, the maximum achievable rate? Right. We can actually before that. Um, we can have a just a little reminder how it looks like in the single cell case. We call this this is the rated sum rate maximization problem for for a given uh, priority order of encoding and decoding. You recall that in the downlink, in the single cell case, this, this was a single cell multi antenna, multiple users with multiple receive antennas. So in the downlink, we cannot solve it directly. So we convert the problem to dual uplink. And the dual uplink optimizes and it's now with respect to the transmit covariance matrices. <clears throat> and for the transmit, uh, when, when we write the the sum rate is easy, it's just solving, solving this one. But if you want to solve the basic sum rate, the different basic, well, sum rate is easy because all these, all these terms here disappear because these are the same. Okay. <clears throat> but for, for general uh, new vector, the, the weight, the weight okay, basically gives you the decoding order at the receiver and the encoding order when you convert that back to the downlink. Okay, anyways, we have this formula that depends on, on this priority order. And now we have a single power constraint, some power constraint in the dual uplink. The power of the dual uplink transmit covariance matrices and some of it over all K uses is upper bounded by a sum power constraint of that one base case, okay? 
you have a that's something you implemented in what's this implemented in in MATLAB or was it single one I guess this was the homework okay all right so now if you want to extend this skipping some details detail derivations you can see that this is equivalent okay this is just a different um slightly different formulation of the same thing you can start with this this term here okay it's a log of ratio okay log of ratio is the same as uh um difference of logs right we can write that one there like log d of a d of b the same as log d of a minus log d of b okay <clears throat> so you can this one can be written as a log of this minus log of that okay and now when you sum up over k you can see that for, for example this in this case mu pi k is associated with this one but the same mu pi sub pi k is associated with this term here then you now take the sum over all k and regroup you get you get to the same exactly the same expression as this one right yes after recouping this happens okay so it's equivalent everybody can see this more or less it's just rearranging you know this this way is just more condensed more efficient way of writing but this one here 4.48 objective is exactly the same as the objective of six of three okay <coughs> so there's nothing different here for a diagonal um for, for uncorrelated noise <clears throat> okay that how to handle this uh per base and power constraint it's slightly tricky now i'm not going to go through the details why it follows why why, why it has this um formulation but this per antenna power constraints can be handled with a some power constraints just like in the dual uplink for the single transmitter <clears throat> but now we have an extra constraint an extra structure for the noise uh, in the single single antenna case this is identity matrix uh, sorry single transmitter case this is an identity matrix right it's an i matrix n0 i that's the variance of noise now to handle the per basis and power constraint in the dual uplink, we have to handle that indirectly <clears throat> by introducing so-called worst case diagonal noise. And this uncertain noise, this is the diagonal matrix with this specific structure where this variable Z are repeated at n sub t times. Okay. So if we have two base stations, each with four antennas, this would be a, a eight by eight matrix. You know, four Z one terms and four Z two terms. Okay. <clears throat> so now the problem is that so if, if first actually the Z is diagonal, right? Then we have exactly the same as. Uh, this is equal to that one. Uh, we have exactly the same pro, um, same as the single single base station case. Okay. Now we have multiple base stations. We have the inner maximization with respect to transit covariance matrices uh, subject to power constraints. But then we have an outer minimization. We have to find the worst possible realization of this Z matrix. <clears throat> that would minimize the, this objective. A bit complicated to, to understand, but uh, for a single, for two, two uh, base station case, it's easy, 
easy to understand. Let's assume that P sub B is P. Okay, how, to, how to solve this? For the two use two bases, I guess it's pretty easy. Right? So if P sub B equals P, you can write this as for two base decimal case as Z1 plus Z2 times T uh, smaller than two times T. Okay, so this T cancels out. And here we have also two times T. So, <clears throat> and now we can write also Z1 as a uh, function of Z2, and we can we can assume that this holds with equality, right? Because if this is smaller than two, it means that you are decreasing the noise, right? This would actually not be the minimal solution of the outer minimizers. You should basically maximize the noise, right? So we can assume that this is this holds with equality. <laughs> So Z1 we can write as a T minus Z2. <clears throat> so basically we can just have a line search over Z1. So how we can solve this for the two user case, a two base decimal case is simple. We just have an outer line search. We start, we just make a grid of Z1s. Okay. Then fix Z. And maximize k u u l x i for fit z, okay. And do this for all three points of z, okay. And then choose the worst, choose the minimum, okay. That's an easy way to compute this for two bases. Of course, if you have more base stations, the search size grows, right? If you have three base stations, then you have to go through all the combinations. The two dimensional search four, three dimensional search. And so when going to larger dimensions, <clears throat> you should use some more optimized algorithms. There are some, some uh, more optimized algorithms explained in that. In the references using some uh, efficient min-max, uh, min-max optimization. Noise the power. Noise? If this is just, it follows from this, um, it just constrains these values of Z. The sum of Z value uh, um, weighted by this PB should be bounded by the sum of PB. Uh, that the justification, it's a bit more complicated, it, it's, it's in, the, in the journal. Uh, it will take too long to go through. Um, it's just a, it's just a constraint. Of course, you need to have a constraint for Z. If you don't have any constraint, just making Z to infinite would be the, the worst case. Right? The rate would be zero. Right? That would not make any sense. There are some some steps that I don't recall by heart. Uh, we can have a, a private discussion afterwards if, if you are interested in this particular. How uh, where this follows from? The details are given in, in this um, reference. Okay, some examples before we have a break. This is for the two user case. These are some old figures of, of mine that I plotted some time ago. Um, so here we have a two base station, two base station scenario. Two transmit antennas in each base station, two, two users, each with two receive antennas. And uh, then we have a scenario with different power imbalance, <clears throat> meaning that if, if a power imbalance is minus three dB, it means that the user users, users are a bit closer to one base station than other. But this is the received power imbalance. If if the uh, so the receive power of one base station is two times higher than with the other base station, that's that's all it means. 
if if the receive power imbalance is minus 10 dB, it means that the basis power of the base station one is 10 times higher than the base station of the base station two. Okay, so it's closer to one. The higher the imbalance, the closer these users are to one of these base stations. Okay, doesn't really matter, just for illustration purpose. So when when we have a small imbalance and fairly large uh, power available. Plot the uh, some power from gas capacity region using this 4.48 formula that the blue curve here. Then we compute the per base and power that's the red curve here. You can see that they are almost overlapping. Okay, not much loss from this extra constraint. Right? <clears throat> the sum power is the same in both cases. Right. In the sum power case, there's no constraint that the power across a certain subgroup of antenna should be should not be exceeded. Right? And then these are just some linear processing algorithms that uh, I used back in the day just to compare its performance with respect to the non-linear case. And similar similar difference uh, applies to the the linear processing case. Now, if we have a, if one, if its users are closer to one base station, then the per base station power constraint really starts to make a big impact, right? Because we cannot transfer power from one base station to another. Then, the, in this case, we could basically transfer all the power of the the more distant base station to to this base station here, here right? Because that's not practical. So there's a large impact when we constrain these powers for base station to be <clears throat> according to you know base station specific power constraints, and it has large impact in that in the rate region as well. Similarly to that, the, the linear the points that we achieve with the linear process. Another another example. Okay, this is just using uh, here. I compare the sum rate optimal linear design and then the the common rate maximization. Common rate meaning that you are basically fixing the ratio, maybe common rate, so fixing the rate ratio, um, ratio of of user specific rates. When the rates are equal, we are trying to find a point. Where the, the rates are equal, like here. The rate of user one is equal to the rate of user two. Okay. And with all these other points correspond to different ratios of users, of user rates. And similarly, plot with the, uh, the rate region of that uh, linear processing compared to the rate region of the, the non linear processing, now with per basis and power constant. Again, you can see that the linear processing, many cases, especially now with multiple antennas, it's quite close to, to non-linear case. There's a quite interesting, especially now with multi-antenna receivers, that you have this, this type of non-convex or non-concave uh, behavior when you plot these rate points. So when you, you, when you fix this, this uh, ratio of rates, uh, to be more or less equal, you can see that it is strictly inferior to what could be achieved by time sharing between these two points, right? It's quite significant. Well, maybe 10% or so, but it's still quite visible difference. Okay. Um, already 20 past. Do you want to have a little break or should we continue all the way to the end? Let's have a break. Okay. Very quick break. Five minutes and let's get back.
Tom, ready? Yes, buddy. Okay, another uh, brief intro to the the basic concepts. Uh, we are going in very much in detail, just to give you like a general idea. You, if someone talks about interference alignment, what it means. So previously we considered the the optimal scenario where we have a coherent transmission. All the users are served by served across this virtual MIMO channel. And, and, and basically, <clears throat> this only applies the case where all users are served by all base cases. So it doesn't apply to scenarios where uh, a subset of base systems are serving subset of users, right? So for that, we cannot find the global. That's, that's by default uh, non-convex problem. But for the case when we have this scenario that everything is fully connected, everything, you know, the whole network is considered as a, as a virtual MIMO. You can estimate channels of, of every user at every transit receive point and so forth. For that, we can compute this absolute maximum. Now the one, another extreme is that we have, a, we have no coordination. We have this type of scenario that we have a, this, this called interference channel. Here we assume that everything is kind of fully connected interference channel. Um, so before we go there, of course, as, as I mentioned, when, the, when we have a, and this is something that we will demonstrate later on. If we have this type of scenario, users are close to the cell edge, the joint transmission is the optimal thing to do. And we can compute the capacity. <clears throat> now, if these users move closer to serving base stations, still obviously the joint transmission is the best thing to do. But if you just plot the base for the case when the, you just assign, consider this as a point minor channels, optimize them without considering the interference. The, first, the larger this distance, the, the more optimal is the, the point to point, ignoring the interference, obviously, right? Depending on the SNR, right? The low SNR, meaning that if you have, if you have little power available here, the power quickly goes below, the receive power quickly goes below the noise level, right? And the noise dominates, and you can just do, you can ignore the interference, right? If, the, if there's a lot of power available, then as long as the, the interference from the other phase system is significant, you should consider it. Anyway, so, <clears throat> so the degrees of freedom is a bit more complicated. It's difficult to say what, what is the, the decrease of freedom in this case when we have uh, it's it's not fully decoupled but it's just partially coupled right so in the low SNR we might have more streams available than in the high SNR because when we increase the SNR now the, the interference becomes dominant and uh, we might you might not be able to allocate as many interference streams, but I think it's interference streams in the, in the final case. Uh, anyway, so it's, it's a bit, uh, bit difficult in general, this concept of decrease of freedom. Here, we assume that we have a fully connected, you know, the bad loss is, it, it's the same, right? This is fully interfering scenario. And we're working in the highest MR that uh, zero forcing is, Asymptotically optimal. So we're basically interested in minimizing the interference, uh, the, uh, suppressing the interference altogether. So now let's consider that we'll start with the simplest scenario. Uh, 
So we have three transistors at the three base stations, each serving one user. Okay, but they are they're fully connected. Could be uh, in practice, it could be a scenario. We have three base stations, these with two antennas. And then you have users right in the middle. Okay. The path loss is the same to all users from all places. Okay. It's a fully uh, symmetric, symmetric scenario. So every base station is fully interfering with the user. Of course, when we take this apart, then, then the interference decreases. Okay, so the question is that how many streams we can transmit here in the field stream? Right? You can see that every point-to-point uh, -point link is upper bounded by two streams. It's two by two MIMO. So two by two MIMO here, two by two MIMO here, two by two MIMO here. Okay, so ideally, when if, if these if these users are very close to the base, each base station. Each user could be served with two by two streams, right? Because the interference can be ignored. But now, when the users are right in the middle. How many streams? Okay, one one uh, solution would be just to send two streams because we have two degrees of freedom at each user. So each user could individually cancel one interfering stream. Right? For sure, we can have support two streams here because. The users can cancel one stream. Okay. Is there anything we can do better? And and there is by by kind of uh, optimal transit receive design, we can find a solution which allows communicate, which allows to assign one stream for each pair of transmit receive. So we can actually find a linear transmitter receiver solution. That gives us a three degrees of freedom in this case, right? Even though at each transmitter we have just two antennas and each receiver we have two antennas. Mm -hmm. And the, the idea is not maybe not so apparent, but it, it makes sense after some processing. It's called interference alignment. So we find a V former solution at each. Transmitter and receiver, especially at the transmitter, that aligns the interference into a single subspace. Right? So we have here, if you think about this link here, uh, so the, the, the interference alignment, because we are the highest NR, it's a kind of altruistic approach that, that we are not considering the desired link at all. We are designing the beam formers such that. It meets these zero interference constraints. So these beams here are jointly designed. So these two beams are designed such that they are aligned. Um, they're seen as one interference source at this receiver. They can be aligned. So this cross product uh, of beam former. Of the TX1 beam form of TX2 multiplied by the corresponding channels is seen as one interference. Right? We can design those beam forms. And then we have this uh, three conditions here. Yes, three conditions. Similarly, uh, the transmission of TX1 and TX2 to uh, TX1 and TX3 should appear as one interference for user two. And transmission of TX2 and TX3 should appear as one aligned interference for user one. And this is possible. You can even you could even do um, you could do even maximum SIMR iteratively. You start with um, maximum SIMR solution, apply MMSC receiver, and the highest NR it would convert to a solution. <clears throat> uh, you could assign one stream for each user, 
and start doing maximum SINR, basically pushing up the SINR, but doing it iteratively, transmit optimizers and receive optimizers. And every step would be optimal, and, and, and uh, you would convert to the solution where uh, <clears throat> where the uh, basically the equivalent interference could be aligned at the receiver at each 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 uh, receiver. But here we can send six streams. Right? I mean, if we think like uh, the X is one entity. And okay, here here. Entity. So, so okay, maybe yeah. Good point. I should have mentioned that we are constrained here. This is not the coherent. Okay, this is not the coherent. Or in coherent case, decrease of freedom on six, right? Because we can assume this as a one joint transmitter with six antennas. And we could assign every, every user two streams. But here the constraint is that no joint processor, just each user is served by one transmitter only. Okay? This is a coordinated beamforming, upper bound. Okay? So we have this coherent beamforming. And coordinated beam forming. This is the coordinated beam forming upper bound. Is this proved to be upper bound or it's proved to proven to be upper bound um, from the degree of freedom perspective, not capacity. It's so still most it is true. Huh? So in this case, at most it is true. Yes. For for a, a constant minor channel. So for a fixed realizer, for a single realizer is another channel, uh, MIMO channel, this decrease of freedom can be characterized. So you can, you can uh, when you have this, um, whatever network with uh, K users, M antenna, this is for the um, symmetric case, M is the antenna, number of antennas, transmitter and receiver. You know, M is two in the previous case, K is three, and D is one. Okay, so you can write so for feasibility conditions, you can write actually it makes intuitively sense sense that you can you can write feasibility conditions. That is there a solution such that that uh, for these beam borders or these smooth projections that would be feasible? Right, you can ask you is there a solution that would could align these two transmitters in the move space of this guy? And is there a solution that would align transmissions of TH1 and TH3 to the move space of receiver two? You can impose, you can write the system of equations, right? Feasibility conditions, basically a system of equations. And and analyzing all those. The, those feasibility conditions of system of equations, you can come up with just algebraic uh, manipulations. You can come up with the feasibility conditions for interference alignment for this constant line. Let's say 10 years ago, you can see from those dates, there was a huge fuss about interference alignment. It, if you look at the literature, it peaked a lot and then increased very fast because didn't make any practical sense. But it's just a good, still a good thing to know that, okay, if you have an interference network, how many streams in general you can allocate interference free. Right. And you, you can write these conditions as k plus one times t smaller equal to two, two f. These are it's just straightforward. Uh, Combination of those values from the from those um, feasibility conditions for the align, alignment conditions. So if you plug in here different values, you can check, for example, if you have number of users is three, number of antennas is two, you can find D. D is the number of streams that you can assign for each transmitter. So computing B from this 2M over K plus one. If M is two, K is three, D is one. It's upper bounded by one, right? If M is four, for example, then D is upper bounded by two. 
if we have four transmit antennas, which makes perfect sense, right? If we have four transmit antennas at each, four receive antennas at each, then we could find a solution which would allow us to allocate two streams each, right? So we would have at each receiver, we would use two degrees of freedom for receiving the desired streams, and then two degrees of freedom for nulling one aligned interference uh, subspace. Two aligned. Huh? Two aligned. No, two aligned into one. Yeah. So two, two, two streams. Two, I mean, four streams, four interfering streams would be seen as two interfering mm -hmm. streams yeah. because they are aligned. And that would fit in here. Like, like with three users with four on the nuts at each time we visit first, two would be the upper one. And you can try with different combinations. This has been extended to to non-symmetric case, different number of antennas receivers. It gets more complicated. And uh, <clears throat> interesting result is that uh, if you keep M fixed, right? Um, but you increase K, let's say, uh, okay, this is the decrease of freedom. This the, is the decrease of freedom for one user. And then the total number, of course, is k times d, k times 2m, k over k plus 1 times 2m which is upper bounded by 2m and called k goes to infinity. Okay, if this goes to one. So the upper bound for uh, this scenario, for example, <clears throat> if we have, if we increase the number of users more and more and more, We are upper bounded by four streams. No matter how many users, the upper bound is four. It's okay. How to how to do that in practice when we have a fractional number? Not so clear. So you you would be of course always practically limited by t. But if you have five users, basically choose three out of five. To serve three streams, three users out of five, the three transmit receive pairs out of five, and then you can do some schedule. Okay. But anyways, you can you can have, you can try here different different values and for example, if you have uh, you could try okay if we have uh, if we have uh, If we have, let's say, four, let's say, you could ask the question that, okay, if we have uh, four transmit receive pairs, how many antennas, how many antennas would we need to have one stream for each? Right, that's one question to, to pose. So you can then add, you can just then plug in here. Uh, oh, you can simply solve, solve from the, uh, from these conditions. Okay, we have four plus one, we have five. So five, uh, so the next M that would satisfy this constant, like integer N would be three, right? So we, we should have three antennas at each user to support alignment for four user pairs. Okay. It's not tight, as you can see. Five 
versus six. Because we have these index set points, so okay, you cannot have a fractional number of unbets. Okay, this is just a kind of general idea that we can also find kind of rough uh, upper bounds or highly interfered scenarios. Of course, this relies on the zero pausing. And uh, that, that's why there was a lot of fuss that, okay, if we apply this interference alignment, which is by default zero pausing, and by default zero pausing is not a good solution for finite SNR. So people were bothered by the fact that, okay, it doesn't work well, right? But in general, if you apply any uh, iterative linear optimized beam format design, it always performs better that alignment in, a, in practical scenarios, in finite scenario, always. So that's why you just plug in your iterative design and you get a better practical solution. Okay, linear transceiver design. This is again an extension of the uh, single antenna receiver case. Now we have two extensions. We have the uh, multipoint transmission, ends up being based as then now some number of independent states. Let's call it capital S. And the capital S is absolutely upper bounded by the degrees of freedom uh, of the coherent transmission network, right? You can think it as a uh, virtual MIMO with N sub B NT antennas, right? Two base stations, four antennas, eight antennas. And then uh, some of the receive antennas. For example, if we have uh, uh, four users, uh, sorry, three users, uh, two antennas at each user, and uh, four antennas at the branch, how many bits of data? Two, three, four. So <laughs> <laughs> two base stations, each base station, four antennas, three users, each three, each user with two antennas. How many degrees of data? Anyone? Six. Three. Someone is telling from June. Six. So okay, good. Six streams. We could assign two streams to each user, right? Because we have eight degrees of freedom at the receiver. So we can assign one more user with two streams in total eight. Okay. Okay. Just to to, uh, to make this more generic, so this S is absolute upper bound, but of course, how many streams we can uh, allocate is now uh, unknown for these other combinations when when the number of the size of this uh, serving set for given stream is. Uh, something less than the total number of base stations, right? And it gets much more complicated and it's a difficult to analyze actually. It's a kind of a mix of joint transmission and uh, with overlapping, uh, overlapping serving sets. Okay, so just to uh, make the indexing a bit easier, at least from one perspective, because there's some uh, complications that follow. Uh, let's introduce a arbitrary stream index S. Okay, stream index S is just one index that that runs from one to capital S. Okay, and then we have a user K sub S. So this is a user index associated with the stream index. So this is the user stream pairing, right? Following more or less, and then we have a, uh, a serving set for a given stream S. Of course, because we have one to one correspondence with the user index and stream index, it is equivalent to P sub K. Okay, P sub K sub S. Complicated, think about it a little. Okay, um, there's an interesting special case which is also used in practice. So, if you don't have a tone transmission, 
they can't, if you cannot have a joint transmission, but um, kind of that, I think it's called dynamic scheduling or something, it's a standard. In principle, we could assign, so like even if you're not using joint transmission, so that let's say the serving set is one, serving set size is one, so each stream is served by one basis only. We could assign one stream, let's say what three one, to be served by this base station. Okay, but then stream two. By this base station, right? So we can have this kind of mixed scenario as well, which actually can be uh, um, useful in practice sometimes. For example, if you have a line of sight channel here, so the rank is one here, and rank is one here. So basically, if you if you only if there's no way that you can serve two parallel streams by one base station because the channel rank is constrained by that the line of sight this Right. Mm -hmm. But now, if you if you if you want to provide this particular user rank two transmission, you can use this kind of dynamic scheduling, whatever it's called in GCPP, that you assign one stream from this base station and another stream from this base station. Now, from the receiver, even though these are a rank one channels both, the receiver can separate. Right. Receiver can just form a receive beam towards this guy and null. Towards that guy, and similarly, resisting for stream two towards this base that then I move, right? So this can be handled. And this is the case that, um, let's say that the base station set is not, can be a, a, a subset of the users. Now, from the user's perspective, uh, actually, this user two is served by two base stations. But each stream uh, non coherent, right? Okay. Yes, from user perspective, I guess it is no different, right? Because it is uh, seeing a uh, no difference, time. yes, no difference, yes. Yeah, it treats in, in no, no matter if, if it receives two streams from this base, it doesn't matter, it's the same MMC processing, right? It still right. estimates that. Uh, Stream specific pilots and then construct the beam for her. Of course, in that in practice, if this is a line of sight channel, it, that's not possible, right? Because the rank is one. But for multi stream transmission from single point. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's possible that we have a that the stream but stream index set is a subset of user index set. <laughs> So, user may receive data from several bases, and while the serving set size for each stream is one, right? Coordinated beam form. Okay. So, this is the extra flexibility that is allowed by using multiple receiver Okay. <clears throat> so, in general, we can, we can now define arbitrary, this is a W here, um, on arbitrary transmit. Um, Stream specific transmit beam formers from basis and B to user K sub S associated with stream S, and then the receive beam former WS uh, uh, applied at the, at the user K sub S. Okay, so then we can define SINR for stream. The SINR, like as we, as we wrote earlier, we have the desired part from all these base stations yks okay and oh, sorry okay, we can have an extra S, S summation here is belong to it's not defined here range of user K 
S belong to I don't know. SK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it contains indices, S indices that are associated with the K. Okay. So now this is the desired signal. And then all the interference. Okay. Now when we have at the receiver, we now focus on a certain S stream S. So it picks a certain S index from here, and the rest goes to the interference. So we get the, uh, the desired signal. This is the desired. Uh, this is the signal energy power component of the stream S at the output of the receiver S, WS. Okay. And then we have all the interference. So you can see now that. This summation here is uh, aggregated across all these multiple base distances that are serving a particular user k sub s for which this three s is associated. Okay. And here, actually, I added this potential phase uncertain. So if we have these local oscillators, <coughs> Now, at base, at both edge bases, they can be made very accurate using this. Uh, uh, what they call anyway, very accurate clocks can be used nowadays with very small PPM uh, variation. Uh, but anyway, if there is some shift between the time of measurement and time of transmission, and that shift is different between base stations. That shift will appear here. Right? And then in the worst case, if the shift is, is large and the, the beam format was designed without taking into account that shift, it can change this constructive combining to destructive combining. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the that's that's why it's so important to have. Okay. If, if this is known perfectly, it can be incorporated into the channel. Right. If it's not known, then it's an extra, extra uh, uncertainty. And I, I, in my in my uh, PhD thesis, uh, I actually have some plots. How is the impact? It can be quite significant. It can it can turn constructive combination of signals at certain user because that's the that's the aim. We want to design these beam formers jointly in a way that that this joint transmission combines coherently in a constructive manner at uh, the desired use. If now this this phase uncertainty appears, this constructive combination can become become destructive. But they they combine in the uh, you know, of the opposite phases and then. Uh, cause destructive kind of fading at the receiver, which is not known at the transmitter. So this is a general SINR model, and there are special cases. Okay, coherent mountain cell being forming. Assume that the serving set size for each stream or each user is the full set, right? All users are served by all base sets. This is the sim simplest thing to handle because we can simply stack all those channels together and consider this as a virtual uh, single cell system. Then we have the other extreme coordinate with single cell being forming. The summation disappears, right? Because the serving set is one. Each, serve, each, each stream is served by, by one, one stream. And, and then you can see that in that case, this doesn't matter, right? Because then if there's only one one term inside the absolute value, and that doesn't affect the SI. We can we can then rotate it arbitrarily and no impact on the SI. Right? Just it's just a common term for the whole thing. If, when when you have a when you only have the summation of these complex values, then this rotation associated with each complex value 
methods, right? Because you can rotate it such that the summation goes to zero in some cases. Okay. And then any combination, which is the practical thing. You can think in practice, it does not make sense to, to serve a single user by more than three or four base stations. Because in practice, if you think about cellular, cellular networks, you know, your base stations are scattered in the in the serving area. Whenever you drop a user, you have uh, say one, two, or three dominant base stations, right? If you have a if you have base three base stations here, right? You drop the user here, you have a dominant base station here. If you drop the user here, you have two dominant base stations. Right. If you drop the user here, you have three dominant base stations. But there's no scenario where you, you have four dominant base stations, right? Because then one would be already at the base. Right? So in practice, uh, at least in uh, let's say this type of cellular setup, doesn't usually make much more much sense to uh, associate to uh, assign more than three. Uh, base stations for a single user for some transmission. We can have a different scenario like a uh, um, okay, uh, factory system, right? That you have uh, antennas placed in the factory walls. This is a different scenario. Then, then you might have then you might have benefits from serving for much more base stations than three. Right. It's a different setup, right? And the same one setup. Okay, let's take a break here and continue tomorrow with some uh, numerical comparison, and then we will move on to with minimum power multi-cell beam forming with user-specific quality of service constraints. Go back to the good old minimum power beam forming, but now across multiple cells and uh, discuss about this decentralized solution which will be your your projects in the end something related to this okay see you tomorrow uh,